So just a little bit about myself. Um, I uh, am from Wisconsin, born and raised in Wisconsin, uh, and went to New Mexico for my surgery training after I graduated from University of Wisconsin, and then came and started my practice in Illinois. Uh, I lived in Woodstock, Illinois, and uh, was there for 15 years before coming back up here to Wisconsin about five years ago, and uh, been at Stoughton Health since I came back. Um, and my experiences in general surgery, uh, prior to a few years ago, my experience with reflux surgery had been in the form of a Nissen surgery, and I'll talk to you about what's involved with that, but we started doing uh, link surgeries here at Stoughton now just, to, just short of three years ago, um, and we've had great success with it, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, as we go, um, and towards the end, what our um, patient experience has been. Uh, so. We'll get started here. Today, we're gonna to talk about GERD, or gastroesophageal reflux disease. We're gonna explain kind of the mechanisms of GERD and, and uh, how, how it um, affects you and what some of the risks are, uh, the complications of GERD, and then how we're gonna manage these symptoms and the treatment options. And um, I know that most of the people listening to this talk and in this room, this is not something that just started bothering you six months ago. This is something that has likely been bothering you for years. And so um, bear with me if some of this is, is a review because you've been living with this problem for a long time and I understand that, but uh, I just wanna make sure we cover the bases. Um, so GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease uh, is a chronic digestive disease. Again, it's not something that, that um, people only have for a few weeks and then it goes away. This is something that people live with for many years of their life. It is caused by a weak, lower esophageal sphincter. So when we look at this picture, this is a picture of your stomach with your esophagus. Um, the lower esophageal sphincter is right here where the esophagus joins your stomach. Um, and this is the mechanism of what reflux is, is that this sphincter is designed to stay closed most of the time to keep the acid in your stomach. So your stomach makes acid to help you digest your food. Uh, your stomach has a protective lining in it that protects it from the acid, but your esophagus does not have that protective lining. So we need this sphincter to keep the acid in the stomach as much as possible. Um, and when that sphincter is not working well and the acid can reflux up into the esophagus, that's where the pain and the damage occurs because you don't, the acid's not supposed to be there. You don't have that protection in your esophagus from that acid. So, how big of an issue is this? Well, we, you know, there's several people in this room and we've got close to 40 people online listening to this talk. So um, this is a, a widespread problem uh, that we deal with in this country and in the world. One in five people in the United States suffer from GERD and we have 20 million people who take PPI medications when we'll discuss a little bit more what that means. But of those 20 million people, 38% of them who are taking those pills still have symptoms, okay? So the pills help, um, they do provide some relief for people, but you'll hear that there's some problems with those medications as we go on in this talk. And we know that at least 38% of people are still gonna have symptoms even when they're taking those medications. We also know that 10 to 15% of people who have GERD can develop something called Barrett's esophagus. Um, and Barrett's esophagus uh, is a change that happens in the esophagus because of that acid damage. We'll explain a little bit more about that. But we know that if you have Barrett's esophagus, that that can mean upwards of a 40 times higher risk of you developing esophageal cancer. So GERD can be a risk factor for developing cancer in your esophagus. So, why does this lower esophageal sphincter get, get weak? And the answer is multifactorial, meaning um, there's lots of things that, that play into this. So the first reason is we don't know why in some people it gets weak, okay? We don't have all the answers, obviously. The human body is an amazing thing, but we don't always know why things don't work like they should. So we don't know in some cases why people have a weak lower esophageal sphincter. Um, 
we do know that over time it can get weaker. So we, we see GERD generally in patients as they age, okay? So I do see some 20 year olds in my office for GERD, but the majority of people we see are later in life. So that sphincter weakens over time. And one of the things, the theories behind that is that the acid actually damages the sphincter as time goes on. So um, many of you in this room, probably when you first started with GERD, could take a pill or a Tums and it went away. But now you maybe are on a higher dose of your medication or you're taking your medication twice a day instead of once a day. Um, and that's because that sphincter has become weaker over time. Um, so it, it diminishes in its, in its function over time. There is some family history involved, okay? So just like anything in health, in health that we see, most of the time there's some truth to the fact that your genetics play a role in it. Um, it also is associated with hiatal hernias. So a hiatal hernia is a pretty unique hernia. Everyone knows what a hernia is. It's, it's a hole in a muscle someplace. And we have hernias in our belly buttons. We have hernias in our groin. A hiatal hernia is a, a hernia in the diaphragm, okay? So when this esophagus, which is the tube when you swallow, food goes down, travels through our chest, and go, has to get into the abdomen where the stomach is. And the diaphragm is a muscle which divides the chest from the abdomen. So there's a hole in the diaphragm where the esophagus goes through and that is called the hiatus, all right? So a hiatal hernia is when that hole gets bigger than it's supposed to, all right? And when that hole gets bigger, not only does it allow the stomach to kind of slide up into it, all right? So the stomach gets kind of sucked up into the chest when you have a hiatal hernia. And when it does that, this sphincter muscle does not work as well, all right? This sphincter muscle is designed to be below the diaphragm. But when it slides above the diaphragm, it does not work as well because in our chest, we have negative pressure. That's how you breathe. You create a negative pressure in your chest um, and that negative pressure is gonna affect how this sphincter works, okay? So a hiatal hernia makes reflux worse because the sphincter doesn't work as well in the chest. It also makes reflux worse because that muscle of the diaphragm is supposed to squeeze a little bit on the esophagus and on the sphincter muscle. And when that gets stretched out, it doesn't squeeze as well. So a hiatal hernia has two mechanisms to make your reflux worse. So if you have a hiatal hernia, it's gonna affect your reflux. What a hiatal hernia does not do is it generally doesn't cause pain like a groin hernia would, okay? I get a lot of patients who come in thinking that their hiatal hernia is giving them upper abdominal discomfort and things. That only happens if it's a very, very large hernia, okay? So hiatal hernias generally do not cause pain. The other thing that isn't on this list but I will mention is our body habitus has an impact on reflux, okay? It's about pressure, okay? And so if you are putting pressure on your stomach, um, it, it, there's more pressure for the acid to go up in the esophagus. So a lot of people have trouble when they bend over. If they have reflux, they bend over, they get more reflux, and that's because they're putting pressure on their stomach. The heavier we are, the more weight that we carry around our abdomen, the more pressure we have on our abdomen, and that's gonna increase reflux. So that's another uh, factor that can impact the sphincter muscle. So what are the symptoms? I probably could just ask you guys, but you're gonna tell me what these are, but heartburn. Heartburn is the main symptom. That's generally burning discomfort in your chest or upper abdomen. Um, regurgitation. <clears throat> regurgitation is when stuff comes up involuntarily into the back of your throat. Uh, it can be acid, it can be food. Um, a lot of people suffer from this. Like I said, when they bend over, they'll get stuff that comes up in their throat. Other people get it at night when they're trying to sleep. Um, they'll get acid up into the back of their throat. They'll wake up coughing or choking. Um, it can be quite frightening for people. That's regurgitation. Here's a bunch of other symptoms. So. Um, it can get up into the lungs and up into the throat and it can cause a sore throat, a cough, shortness of breath. Um, it can cause damage to your esophagus which can make it difficult to swallow. Uh, it can get up into your mouth and cause problems with your dentition, with your teeth. Um, and it can also make your asthma worse or cause chest discomfort. People can end up in the emergency room thinking they're having a heart attack and they're really just having bad reflux, okay? So those are, um, most of the symptoms, but there's probably more. 
So this does affect your quality of life. It, it, it affects it in a, in a significantly negative way. So people who suffer with severe reflux, they don't sleep well because their heartburn, they lay down at night and their heartburn comes or they get regurgitation. Like I said, it wakes them up in the middle of the night. So they don't get good sleep, which reduces work productivity if you're tired. Um, it, you are, have all been told in this room what you can and can't eat because of your reflux, right? So it impacts what you can eat and how, you know, whether you eat a, have a chocolate after dinner or something like that, or when you can eat, you've probably been told don't eat after a certain time of the day so that your reflux doesn't bother you at night. So it, it, it definitely impacts your diet. Um, there's also concerns about what are the long-term effects of GERD and what are the side effects and what kind of damage. We already mentioned that it can be uh, a risk factor for potentially developing esophageal cancer. There's also other things that can be affected and we'll talk about those. And also, um, you, lifelong dependence on medication. We're gonna spend some time talking about these medications that probably most of you listening to this talk are on um, and what are some of the potential issues with those medications. Um, so we'll talk more about that as well. <clears throat> So what are some of the complications that can happen from GERD? So these pictures are pictures from an endoscopy. So an upper endoscopy, uh, put a scope down, look into your esophagus, and they've taken these pictures. So on the right here, esophagitis. That just means inflammation of the esophagus. So I mentioned in the beginning, your, your esophagus does not have any protection against that acid. So if acid is going up into your esophagus, Frequently, it's going to cause damage to the, the esophagus. It causes inflammation. It can cause ulcers um, and erosions. So this is a picture. This, the esophagus should look nice and pink. This yellow exudate and stuff is ulcers and inflammation in the esophagus. It can cause a stricture. So if your esophagus is inflamed over a long period of time, it can get scarring in it. And that can make it stiff and, and narrow. And when that happens, it can lead to something called dysphagia, which means difficulty swallowing. So when you swallow, things can get kind of hung up uh, in your esophagus. It also can cause um, not just a stricture, but it can just cause the muscles in the esophagus to not work very well. Uh, and when we'll talk a little bit more about this later too, but part of our workup to decide if someone's a candidate for an anti-reflux surgery is to look at those muscles in the esophagus and make sure that they're functioning correctly because long-term reflux can affect that. Barrett's esophagus, we mentioned that already. This is considered a precancerous lesion. Now, there are different severities of Barrett's esophagus to the point where er, there's uh, something called short segment, non-complicated Barrett's where basically, literally, they just are gonna watch you every three to five years, make sure that it's not getting worse to all the way to Barrett's with dysplasia, which is really considered, this is gonna turn into cancer any time now, we need to do something to treat it. Um, and so there's kind of that spectrum. But basically, Barrett's is a really interesting thing. I think that, that sometimes it's fascinating how the body works. So I mentioned that the stomach has this protective lining and the esophagus does not. So what your body senses when you have long-standing bad reflux is that your esophagus is getting damaged. And so it needs a protective lining. So what happens is, is that protective lining in the stomach starts to creep up the esophagus to try and protect it. But that lining isn't supposed to be there in the esophagus. So when it gets up in the esophagus, it has a tendency to potentially turn into cancer, okay? So your body is trying to protect itself, but it backfires is basically what happens with Barrett's esophagus. So um, very interesting thing, but we know that in 10 to 15% of people, with GERD, they will get this, Barrett's esophagus. And again, up to, that can increase your risk of four, up to 40 times of getting esophageal cancer. I'm not standing here telling you that everyone with reflux is gonna get cancer. That's not what I'm saying. It just, it is a potential risk factor. And here is a slide showing an esophageal cancer. Um, this is an interesting slide because this is the cancer this is really normal looking esophagus. And then this is Barrett's esophagus. It's all three things right in the same picture here. So esophageal cancer is the sixth most common cause of cancer death worldwide. And it's estimated that we'll see 20,000 new cases every year in the United States. Um, and we have seen a pretty significant rise in um, esophageal cancer over the last 25 to 30 years. 
So this slide is, is interesting in that this is showing several of the more common cancers, breast cancer, lung cancer, colorectal cancer. And this slide is a little bit dated. Um, and I've tried to get new, new data from, but I, but I haven't been able to find a, a slide that shows this very well. But this is basically showing from 1975 to the year 2000. And um, I'll tell you that these trends have, have pretty much continued at a, at a similar rate. But what we see is that lung cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer really have stayed pretty much the same as far as the incidence goes uh, in this country. But what we see is that back in the early 80s, we see esophageal cancer increasing significantly. And we don't really know exactly why that is. It could be a lot of factors. It could be environmental. It could be the foods we eat have a lot more impurities in them or whatever. Um, but what we also, what we do know is that in the early 80s is when people started taking Pepsid, Protonics and all these medications to try and control their acid reflux. That's when all these medications came out. And so one of the concerns is that, and I'll show you a little bit later in this talk, that those medications don't really stop reflux. They just make it so you don't notice it as bad. Um, and the concern is that maybe this non-acid reflux, so maybe the fact that we're buffering the reflux but it's still happening, maybe that is potentially causing more damage to the esophagus. I don't know the answer to that, but it's clear that we're seeing an increase in esophageal cancer. So how do we diagnose GERD? Um, certainly by symptoms, okay? So you're having heartburn, regurgitation. Um, that's the main way we diagnose this, but how do we definitively know if someone's having GERD? So we can do an upper GI study or a barium esophagram. You swallow barium, they roll you around on a table and they watch it reflux up out of the stomach. Um, that's one way to diagnose GERD. Um, an upper endoscopy, so we just saw those pictures and they do an, a scope and they'll see that you have uh, esophagitis, you've got inflammation in your esophagus from acid reflux. Um, that will help determine that. Um, esophageal manometry is what I mentioned briefly earlier. That is a, a study to measure how well the muscles in the esophagus are actually functioning. Um, when you swallow, do the muscles actually push the food through the esophagus like they're supposed to. And as I mentioned, peop some people with long-standing reflux um, will have um, problems with those mechanisms so their esophagus won't be functioning well. There are also certain diseases of the esophagus where those muscles are contracting either stronger than they should or not strong enough um, that can cause symptoms that mimic reflux. And so we often will get a manometry to rule out some of those problems. And then lastly, a pH study. There's two different kinds of pH studies. Uh, there's a 24-hour and a Bravo 48-hour study. We do typically the 48-hour study. Um, I don't know, has anyone in this room had a pH study where they had to walk around with a, um, like a wire out of their nose for a day? No? Okay, lucky, lucky. You had that? Okay, so that's the 24-hour study. They basically, a pH sensor is an acid sensor, okay? And they can put an acid sensor in your esophagus, um, and the old-fashioned ones had a wire that would then come out of your nose and hook up to a little box that you carried around, um, and uh, they would measure how much acid is in your esophagus. Now, thankfully, we have a better way to do that. We have the Bravo pH, which is basically a little sensor that they when they do an endoscopy, they stick it in your esophagus. It sticks to the side of your esophagus and it'll stay there for several days and transmit data to a little box that you carry around. Um, and what it does is it gives us a really good objective evidence, hour to hour, minute to minute, how much acid is in your esophagus. It also has some buttons on it that you can push. So when you're having heartburn, you push the button and then we can look on the tracing and say, yep, they're having heartburn and yes, there's acid in their esophagus. So it really allows us to quantify how bad your reflux is because the reality is, is everybody has some reflux, okay? It's normal to have a little bit of reflux, but we wanna know, is it really bad, okay? So the, the pH study tells us that. <laughs> so, Let's move on to symptom management. And um, I included this little clip. I, I think it's kind of funny. It's a, it's a comedian and he's talking about um, having a discussion with his doctor about reflux um, because probably all of you have had this discussion. He's a good doctor, I think, you know. I told him I get heartburn sometimes. So he goes and gets me a list of things that cause heartburn. I'm looking at the list and I'm like, I already know this. <laughs> 
I know how to get it. That's like going into the hospital with a cannonball wound and they show you a list. Here's how you get cannonball wounds. I already, I, I have a cannonball wound. It's gaping. Do you have a tube of cannonball wound ointment? Number one, do not stand directly in front of a cannon. How true that is. So hopefully you don't feel like that when you go to your doctor. But Symptom management. And this is what the comedian was talking about. You know, you've all seen these lists of all these things that you can't do or shouldn't do. It's going to make your heartburn worse. Spicy foods, caffeine, fatty foods, tomato-based foods. Fruits, chocolate, alcohol, carbonated beverage. I mean, there's really nothing left, right? After you cross all this stuff off. So um, you've also been told to elevate your bed at night. Um, so these things all can help. I'm not saying they can't help, but they're not solving the problem, right? Um, and they do kind of take some of the fun out of life to not be able to enjoy all of that. So, so what can we do with, with medication? So there's basically three kinds of medications that we use to treat Heartburn and reflux, um, the simplest things are the antacids, Mylanta, Rolaids, Tums. Those are just buffers. So basically you, you take those and they, they buffer the acid, okay? Um, so you, you, they're going to reduce the, the quantity of acid in your stomach by just buffering it. H2 blocker, blockers, Pepsid, Tegamet, Zantac, those are, what they do is they block one of the signals that goes to your stomach that signals it to produce acid. So your stomach actually gets, has three different ways that it can produce acid, three different signals it gets. H2 blockers block one of those receptors. And so they, I, I consider them kind of mid-range. They're, they are gonna help some for some people, but most people with severe reflux, they're not gonna find a lot of help with these because it's only blocking one way that the stomach produces acid and there's two other ways that it can happen. And then the proton pump inhibitors or PPI medications, uh, the purple pill, Prilosec, Nexium, all of these, these actually turn off the acid pumps in the stomach. So, so they're gonna um, be the best at reducing the amount of acid that's produced in your stomach. Um, so that's the three classifications. So the benefits of those medications is that they do reduce the amount of acid in your stomach. Um, and because the acid isn't as bad, it may reduce the amount of inflammation in your esophagus when the acid does come up. Um, and for many patients, they're gonna provide relief, um, but the relief can be temporary, okay? So the limitations is that this really doesn't cause or doesn't affect the cause of reflux. It doesn't make the lower esophageal sphincter any stronger. It's just reducing the amount of acid in your stomach. Um, it does not prevent reflux. And in fact, I'll show you a slide in a little bit. When you take your protonics or your, your Prilosec, you have the same amount of reflux for that next 12 hours as if you didn't take it. You just don't notice it as much because it's not as acidy, okay? So it does not stop reflux. And we already said that up to about 40% of patients will still have symptoms. And you, you, have to, you can't just take this for a couple weeks and stop it. If you have a bad sphincter, it's going to continue to be bad. So people end up taking this for years, decades even. They take this medication. Um, and there are some side effects, although I would say most people don't have a lot of side effects from these medications. So um, some people will get some diarrhea from the protonics or nausea, constipation, headache, but I don't hear a lot of people complaining of those problems with the medications. So this is on the slide I was talking about here that patients have the same amount of reflux whether they're on or off the medication. So this is PPI medications um, and the person who was not taking the PPI medications, they had 70 reflux episodes and basically most of them were pretty acidy and some of them were weakly acidy. Then they're on the PPIs, they have the same number of refluxes 
they're just mostly now weakly acidic instead of strongly acidic. So the actual number of refluxes is the same. Um, so this study is just kind of illustrating that point that it really, the medications don't stop your GERD, they just make it more tolerable, okay? And incidentally, this is one of the reasons why people find that they have to increase the doses over time because remember I said early on that that sphincter can be damaged by the acid. So you're still having these reflux episodes and that's why you may start out on one pill once a day for, for a few years and then all of a sudden you're taking a pill twice a day then you're taking double dose twice a day and it keeps going up because you're still having the reflux. So let's move on to talking about the, the PPI medications because I don't know, have, have some of you heard from either in the news or in the newspaper or whatever from your doctors that there may be some problems with taking these PPIs long-term, uh, some of you maybe. So um, I wanna stress that, I'm, that these PPI medications, a lot of people take these and they do work for many people. There are some concerns about being on them long-term, however. Um, all of these studies that I'm gonna show here are what we call population studies, which basically show that in a big group of people, who are taking PPIs in a group that aren't, that there's a little, that there's a higher risk of some of these problems in the people who are. So I'm not saying that you're gonna get these problems if you continue to take these medications. I'm just saying that there's a little bit higher risk of some of these problems when you're taking these medications long-term. So we can see here that there's a possible incre increased risk of bone fractures. The PPIs do affect how we absorb our calcium and magnesium, um, and that can affect our bones and our bone strength. We also um, can see a higher risk of patients getting what's called C. diff diarrhea. Um, we used to put all kinds of patients in the hospital on these PPI medications and we don't do it anymore because it, it, we found that it did increase the risk of getting this, this bad infectious diarrhea um, called C. diff colitis. Um, we see that there's a slightly that there's an increased risk of myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack in the general population of people who are on proton pump inhibitors. We see an increased risk of kidney disease and progression and progression to renal failure. We see a risk of dementia. I'm going to play you a video right now that is a, a guy and he's going to explain why we think that people have problems with their heart and their kidneys and dementia potentially when they're on these medications long-term. Long-term use of proton pump inhibitors may not be good for your body, may not be good for your blood vessels. It's been shown now by our group and others that users of PPIs are at increased risk for dementia, heart attack, renal failure. So we now have the mechanism, we now have the smoking gun that explains these observations it raises the question of whether these drugs should be over the counter. Should they be used without medical supervision? I think not. I think that the regulatory authorities should reconsider uh, the um, use of these drugs over the counter. There are some people that absolutely need these drugs. They have severe GERD, severe heartburn, and they need these drugs. There are other drugs on the market other than PPIs, but other antacids uh, that could be used. What we found in this paper was that those cells that form the lining, human endothelial cells, exposed chronically long-term to proton pump inhibitors age faster. And the reason for that is that there are little structures in cells called lysosomes. They're like garbage disposals. They get rid of the junk that's accumulating in the cell. We found that the proton pump inhibitors are impairing the ability of those little garbage disposals to make acid. They don't work as well. Garbage is accumulating. We actually can see that in the endothelial cell. Over long periods of time, garbage is accumulating. It causes stress on the cells and they age faster as a result. And they can't function as well. They can't proliferate as well. They can't do their job. Long-term studies of vascular health have not been performed in people taking the proton pump inhibitors. We need to do those studies. We need to determine if the findings that we have right now really apply to our patients, really apply to people out there in the community that are taking these drugs. So I would love to have my colleagues in the scientific community help me with this. And uh, we're certainly gonna get started here at Houston Methodist on this study. Endothelial cells are the cells that line the little 
blood vessels in our bodies, okay? So that's the lining of all of our little blood vessels. So what he's saying is that because we're stopping acid production in our stomach, we're also, the unintended consequence of that is that we're stopping acid production in those little garbage disposal organelles or whatever in the cells, okay? So the garbage disposals in the cells so that they're not able to get rid of toxins as quickly and showing damage. So again, he, this, is, this is test tube type medicine here, okay? As he said, there's not been long-term studies on humans as far as um, that goes. However, um, that is a potential reason for why we see some of these um, vascular issues because really when you talk about heart attacks, kidney failure, dementia, that's all known as a vascular issue. So I'm gonna play one more video here which should work. Tonight, a new warning about some of the most popular prescription drugs in America, treating heartburn and acid reflux. They're now also sold over the counter. While it's already known they're linked to a risk of fractures and infections, now a new study finds they can have another serious side effect. NBC's Ann Thompson has the details. Can't afford to let heartburn get in the way? Stopping heartburn is big business. Zero heartburn! Sold as Nexium Prilosec and Prevacid, more than 15 million Americans shelled out over $10 billion in 2013 for the prescription versions of these drugs called proton pump inhibitors. Now a new study from Johns Hopkins says these acid-reducing drugs may increase the risk for chronic kidney disease 20 to 50%. Cleveland Clinic kidney specialist Dr. Cheryl Cancel is treating Kim Hinkle. Kim had normal kidney function in March, and then blood work in August showed kidney function down to 30 percent. Kim was taking one of the over-the-counter versions. On a hunch, Dr. Cancel had Kim stop and her kidneys improved. I was lucky it was caught early and that we can do something about it. For over-the-counter acid reducers, the FDA recommends they be used for 14 days and no more than three times a year. For the prescription versions, the package insert recommends for most conditions, the pills be taken for up to eight weeks. Pills are not the only answer. Food is the answer. Dr. Jonathan Aviv prescribes the drugs, but insists his patients also avoid acidic foods, like berries, chocolate, and anything with caffeine for 28 days. You can change your diet and reduce acid production and actually heal your own body by what you're eating. The makers of these drugs say they are safe and effective when used correctly. That and diet can keep stomach acid where it belongs. So that's, that's kind of an overview of the medications. Again, um, these medications help many people and they work for many people. And I recommend the medications for some people, for people as well, depending on, on what their symptoms are and what their, um, wor their workup that we do shows us. But why would we consider surgery for someone? So you're all in the room and listening online because you wanna know, am I a candidate to have surgery? So um, what we do is we, we look at people who are on medications and continuing to have symptoms. So if, if you are someone who's maybe taking a Pepsid twice a day or one Protonix a day and you're having symptoms a couple times a week, we may not recommend we jump right to surgery. But if you're someone who is finding that you're having to, to um, really take a lot of medication to control your symptoms or it's even when you take a lot of medication, it's not controlling your symptoms, you're someone who would benefit potentially from surgery. Um, is reflux really negatively impacting your quality of life? Are you someone who uh, wakes up every night choking on acid? So you don't get, you're afraid to go to sleep in your bed because you're choking on acid, so you're sleeping in a chair in your living room. Um, that's someone who we would consider uh, the surgery for. Um, if you're concerned about potential risks and complications of GERD, so you're um, concerned about Barrett's esophagus, esophageal cancer, um, you've had a scope that shows that you have esophagitis, um, that would be someone we would consider. And also, if you're someone who really just wants to get off of these medications, um, then potentially the uh, option to have surgery is a good option. Um, also, you know, these medications, not only just, we talked about the side effects, but um, they cost a lot too for some people um, if their insurance coverage isn't great. Um, and potentially insurance will cover one of these medications, but won't cover the one that your doctor really wants you on that you tolerated better or worked better for you. So they can be quite expensive. Um, so those are all people that we, 
consider a candidate for surgery. So I mentioned in my introduction that uh, in my previous practice before I came up here and started with the Lynx three years ago, we did a lot of this surgery for, for reflux and it's called a Nissen fundoplication. And I just wanna talk about it a little bit so that we can contrast and compare the Lynx um, procedure to it. So this is a laparoscopic surgery. Um, and basically the idea with this surgery is we're gonna strengthen that sphincter muscle by wrapping the stomach around the sphincter muscle. So what we do is we wrap the stomach around the esophagus and stitch it here in front so that now it's squeezing on that sphincter muscle and helping to strengthen the sphincter muscle. Um, so this surgery has, is really the gold standard. It's been around for decades, all right? So I think the 50s, they've been doing it. Um, and I've done many of these surgeries. So it works well for reflux. It is laparoscopic, as I mentioned. It takes a couple hours. Uh, most patients stay at least one night and sometimes two or three days in the hospital. Um, there are significant dietary restrictions after the surgery. Most patients are on a liquid diet for a while after the surgery, um, anywhere from uh, a couple days up to a couple weeks or even a month or so, they can be on a liquid or a very soft diet. Um, you may need a week or two off of work. And the, the, the issue with this surgery and what has led to um, a lot of different um, studies and a lot of different technology trying to find a better way to stop reflux is that there are significant side effects with this surgery. Number one, it does change the anatomy of the stomach. This part of the stomach should be over here. It's not designed to be wrapped around. And that can change how the, the stomach fun functions a little bit. But the other thing is that when we're doing this surgery, it's, it's kind of hard to know how tight to wrap that stomach around the esophagus. So you're kind of eyeballing it, to be honest with you. And so it's really easy to put it on too tight or too loose to wrap that stomach around. So if it's not tight enough, you're not gonna have good reflux control, right? Um, so most surgeons tend to wanna, you know, the last thing we wanna do is do a surgery and have you wake up and then have it not help at all, right? So we're gonna try and put it on a little bit tighter. And when it's a little bit tighter, um, it can cause Number one, difficulty with swallowing. Um, but more importantly, it makes it difficult with this surgery to belch and vomit, okay? You probably don't know how many times during the day you belch, but I, trust me, it's several times a day and, and it's many times a day. So if you can't belch, all that gas can't go anywhere. It's just gonna sit in your GI tract and you're gonna be bloated. And so abdominal bloating is a very significant side effect from the Nissen surgery and to the point where if you talk to, um, I've talked to my gastroenterology colleagues, when I first moved here to, to Stoughton, I, one of the uh, Dean gastroenterologists who's, who's um, excellent gastroenterologist, he told me flat out, he said, you won't be seeing any um, Nissen referrals from me because I, I don't send my patients for that surgery because I just see too many of them that are, don't do well. And you guys do the surgery and then they end up in my office complaining about how bloated they are for the rest of their lives and I'm not gonna, send you any. So, so that, that's been the problem with this surgery is that it just has that very bothersome side effect. So what about the Lynx? So the Lynx is, is different. It's basically, and we're gonna show you a little video, it's basically a little bracelet of magnets that just fit around that sphincter muscle. And basically this was FDA approved in 2012. I'll tell you that they they, they developed this out in California um, and it was, they developed it in the mid 2000s. So they really started putting it in people in the mid to late 2000s. It took several years to get FDA approved. So it's been FDA approved now for nine years. It's been proven safe and effective. I have literally dozens and dozens of studies that show that it's a safe and effective surgery for uh, reflux. Um, it also is a minimally invasive procedure done laparoscopically. Um, in contrast to the Nissen surgery, we send all of our patients home the same day, so you do not spend a night in the hospital. Um, and basically, starting the day of surgery, you're eating solid food, okay? So there's not um, the several weeks of being on liquid diet. Um, it is designed to be a permanent solution for GERD. So one of the other issues I forgot to mention with the Nissen surgery is 
we're wrapping your stomach around the esophagus. It's soft tissue and we're just putting stitches in it. And what can happen over time is that can stretch and loosen. And there's a term called the slipped nissen. That is a very common term. And it's, what that means is basically that wrap slipped or loosened up. And so we, we see patients who had, who've had nissens who will tell you, yeah, I had really good results for a year or two. I didn't have reflux, but it's now five years out and I'm having a lot of reflux because everything's just loosened up again. The links is magnets that aren't gonna lose their attractiveness over a period of time. So it's designed to be permanent. I mentioned that with the Nissen surgery, we were kind of eyeballing how tight to put that wrap on. The Lynx comes in several different sizes. So during the surgery, I have a sizing device that goes around your esophagus um, and it tells me exactly what size to put on. So that gives, what I see with that is I see much more consistent results because we're not guessing where we know we're putting on the exact right size for your esophagus. And so we know that this is how that's gonna recover, how, how you're gonna be able to swallow, how you're gonna be able to eat afterwards. I can pretty much tell you on a week to week basis how things are gonna go after this surgery. So that consistency of putting on the right size I think makes a huge difference. So there's a picture of the links. You guys all have the, the stuff in front of you, but basically it goes right around that sphincter muscle. It just helps keep that sphincter muscle closed. And when you swallow, food can pass through. There's just a little cartoon here. There it is. It just kind of shows swallowing. There's your esophagus going down. This, is, this little cutout is your diaphragm. So the lynx goes below the diaphragm, around the esophagus, and now that that's on there, they can't reflux, and yet when you swallow, the food's gonna pass through that, okay? So that's how the, the lynx goes on, and that's how it works. So again, uh, it's a minimally invasive procedure. It generally takes us about an hour, okay? Now, we've, we talked about hiatal hernias earlier, we fix a hiatal hernia at the same time. I mentioned that it's important that the diaphragm is tight up against the esophagus, up against that sphincter. So if you have a hiatal hernia, we're gonna fix that. Um, and really the size of the hiatal hernia is kind of the determining factor on how long the surgery takes. But most surgeries take about an hour. Um, you will go home the same day. Um, you'll resume a relatively normal diet. Um, we do not change the stomach. We're not wrapping the stomach. We're not changing that anatomy. Um, you're gonna be able to belch, all right? I have not had a single patient come to me after we've done the surgery and say they can't belch. I, ha I just recently had my first patient come to me and say that he wasn't able to vomit. So there is a possibility that vomiting could be a challenge. Um, he's the first one that I've had tell me that. So we don't see a lot of the gas bloating. And I, there's a, maybe the first few weeks you might have some gas bloating, um, but I've not had anyone come back and complain of long-term um, gas bloating. The Lynx is removable, so it can come out. We thankfully have not had to take any out since we started putting them in, because um, we don't want to. It's an expensive device, and we, we want you to you know, do well and not feel like you want this thing to come out. We want it to, to work, because obviously if we take it out, you're gonna be back to where you were before. So uh, we have not had to take it out, but it is easier to take this out than to undo a Nissen surgery. So um, that, that is uh, something to be aware of. Um, so this is a study, this is one of the studies um, that came out after it was FDA approved. Basically, this is a, about 100 patients who had the Lynx procedure, and then um, five years later, they were asked, how, how are you doing, okay? So what we see here is that 85% of patients were free of daily medication. So that means free of Pepsid, PPIs, Tums, okay? So 85% of patients not taking daily medication. I notice it's not 100%, all right? I'm not gonna claim that this is 100%. 88% of patients were free of heartburn, okay? Again, not 100%, but remember the medication is only about 60%, so it is better than medication, okay? 99% of patients were free of regurgitation. So if you are someone who is waking up at night because acid's coming up in the back of your throat, this eliminates that. Okay, that gets rid of that. Some of my happiest patients have come back and said, you know, the best thing about this is I can sleep. Okay, I don't have to sleep with my pillow up and my bed on, a, on blocks. I can sleep flat and I'm not waking up with stuff in the back of my throat. Um, so 
freedom from bloating. So when you compare, again, links to a Nissan, we have a lot less bloating and overall quality of life. So are you better off now than five years ago before we did the surgery? About 95% of patients say yes, okay? So again, not 100%, all right? This, they recently came out with a 10-year study and these numbers have decreased a little bit by about two percentage points across the board, okay? So over time, there is some dis diminishment in value. And the reality is, is that's probably, the reason that is, it's not because the Lynx isn't working anymore, it's because that hiatal hernia has come back a little bit, okay? That's a big problem with hiatal hernias is they tend to come back very easily. So um, we're seeing that the Lynx, when we fix the hiatal hernia and put a Lynx on, actually patients have a much lower risk of a recurrent hiatal hernia than if we just go in and fix a hernia and do a Nissen. So it's actually beneficial, but over time those hernias do come back and that's why these numbers go down a little bit. So I just wanna tell you about our program a little bit. So we, as I said, started to, I think our first one was in uh, 2018 in November, I believe, late October, early November. And so we've done about, we've done 40 exactly since then, okay? So 40 patients, um, we have every single patient that we've done has gone home the same day. We've not had any um, major complications like bleeding, no one's gotten a blood transfusion, um, no one's had to be converted to an open procedure, we've had no injuries of other structures, so we've done it safely in those 40 patients. Um, I would say that there are, that I'm aware of, that I can think of, um, three patients, I believe, who are still taking medication. Okay, um, I just saw one of them a week ago. He is taking um, a daily PPI medication. Before the surgery, he was taking a PPI in the morning at night with a Pepsid at morning and night. So he was on huge doses of medication. He's taking one Pepsid a day and feeling pretty good, okay? So that's kind of the difference that we see. Um, we have not had to take any um, lynxes out because people were having trouble um, and Universally, these are some of my favorite patients because they come back and they're they're very happy. You know, they're they're very the reflux was affecting them um, in such a negative way. I had one gentleman. Um, he actually was, came to one of these um, talks once, and he said that he's 100% positive that he got a divorce because of his reflux because he was so miserable. That he couldn't didn't want to go out, didn't want to do anything, and his wife wanted to do things, and he didn't want to go to restaurants, and it just led to problems, and he ended up with a divorce. And he told me, he said, you know, he said I would have taken out a second mortgage in my of my house to get this surgery, knowing what I know now after we did the surgery on him. He was so happy with it. So it really does have an impact on people. That being said, it is not all good, okay? And by that I mean, if you have any anti-reflux surgery, and the Lynx is, is an example as well, it does change how you eat, okay? We are tightening up your sphincter muscle. And so you have to be careful how you eat. You cannot take huge bites of food and eat really fast because things will get stuck. So I spend a lot of time talking to patients about how they have to eat after this. You have to take small bites of food. You have to chew your food really well. You have to drink lots of liquids or sauces when you eat um, and you have to, to take small bites, okay? And there are certain foods that can be really difficult. The toughest food to eat is bread, okay? So if, I don't know why it is, but bread is really hard to swallow. It's the hardest thing for your esophagus to, to push through. So um, I would say about half the patients that I've done the surgery on don't eat bread anymore, okay? So if you're someone who loves eating brats and burgers on buns, um, you'll be eating them without buns after the surgery most of the time, okay? So, so we, we spend a lot of time talking about that because I'm not trying to, um, you know, com totally convince everyone in this room that they need this surgery because that's not the case. We're very selective. We, we do a lot of testing and I'm gonna go over that a little bit with you real quick. Uh, we, we want you to have a good result. I don't wanna have to take your links out um, a year after we put it in because you can't swallow anymore, okay? Because you don't like the way you're swallowing. So we go over this in, in a lot of detail. Um, so, this is just a summary of kind of what we talked about. I will, I will mention to you briefly here the testing that's involved. So this, a lot of insurance companies still consider this experimental, despite the fact that 
It's been FDA approved for nine years. And like I said, there's dozens of studies that show that it's safe and effective. The good news is, is that in our area, both Quartz and, and Dean or SSM are pretty good about, allow, about covering this in most cases. Some of the other insurances, we might run into some other difficulties, but generally we've only had a couple patients where we weren't able to do the surgery because their insurance did not approve it. But for all insurances to approve this, there are certain tests that need to be done. So everyone has to have an upper endoscopy. Everyone has to have one of those 48 hour pH studies, okay? And the kicker on that pH study is you have to stop all of your reflux medicine for a week before we do it. And that's, that's the tough thing for, for most people. They, it's tough, okay, and I understand that, but we have to have you off of it. We have to have um, no masking of how bad your reflux is. Um, so you have to have an EGD with the pH study. Um, most patients require um, a manometry. So that study where we, we see how well the esophagus is squeezing because if your esophagus isn't squeezing well and we put this lynx on you, you're not gonna be able to swallow at all and that's gonna be a problem. So we wanna make sure your esophagus is working. We also do an esophagram, the barium swallow, and we actually have you swallow marshmallows and bread soaked in barium to watch it go through to make sure things, and we tip you on your head a little bit. So we, we put you to the test to make sure that your esophagus is working well. So those tests are all required, not just by us, but by the insurance in order to get approval. Um, that process can take several weeks, as you can imagine, to get that test done. I don't do the endoscopy and the pH test. We have to send you to the gastroenterologist. And so um, we're kind of dependent on their schedule and it can take several weeks to get all that done. Um, so it is a process. Um, but I'll, I'll just let you know what the process is. Basically, if you're interested in potentially um, hearing more about this or talking to me in person and telling me your story as far as reflux goes, um, we can we set up a consultation. You'll come in, you'll meet me face to face. We'll sit down, we'll talk about your reflux. And then if we decide that you know, you're a good candidate to go forward with things, we, the first thing we do is we get that upper endoscopy and the pH study scheduled, okay? Um, and Because that's kind of the rate limiting step for us. So we get that scheduled. And quite honestly, I, I have a pretty low threshold to get that because if you've been suffering from reflux for, for a long time, it's a good idea to get an endoscopy anyway. And even if you just had one a couple years ago, you probably didn't have a pH study with it. So this helps us know um, how bad your reflux is and then we can have a more realistic conversation about whether surgery is a good idea for you or not.